Hello, my name is Edith Michelle, and I'm really happy to be with you today and to support the Do It Now movement a fundraiser to raise money for needed supplies for needy children and as they think about going back to school, whether school is from home or at uh, in classroom, um, there are lots of kids in our world, in our nation that need support and so we appreciate your tuning in today and supporting that cause. And um, as a storyteller, I'm uh, really excited and uh, delighted to share this story uh, with you. Uh, I just learned about it myself. It's the story of Ruby Bridges. And it's also the story of uh, why the Brown versus Board of Education landmark decision um, in 1954, I think it was, uh, that the Supreme Court made um, is important. And uh, this young girl, um, who was six at the time, um, really demonstrates the importance of why that law had to come to be. And so in the 1950s and 1960s, school integration was really uh, an important part of the civil rights struggle. And that's what we're going to learn about today. The story of Ruby Bridges. All right, here we go story of Ruby Bridges. I wanted to just make sure that you can see the book. Wonderful. Story of Ruby Bridges, written by Robert Coles and illustrated by George Ford. It's a scholastic book and I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, one thing I want to tell you first is that Ruby Bridges was born in 1954 in a small town in Mississippi her parents were sharecroppers. Many of you may not know what that means. A sharecropper is a farmer. And uh, as part of the uh, relationship that the farmer had with the landowner, whatever was you know, raised would sort of be used as part of the rent um, for payment for living um, on the farm. And so it was a very difficult way of existing. Um, imagine being out in the field all day, Mississippi is pretty hot all day, in the scorching sun. So a very difficult uh, life that Ruby Bridges was born into. In fact, the day before Ruby was born, her mother had 90 pounds of cotton on her back. Knowing she was going to have a baby, didn't know when, but knowing that she was going to have a baby, carrying 90 pounds of cotton is not an easy life. Not an easy life at all. Okay, so Ruby Bridges was born in a small cabin near Tylertown, Mississippi. We were very poor. Very, very poor, Ruby said. My daddy worked picking crops. We just barely got by. There were times when we didn't even have much to eat. The people who owned the land were bringing in machines to pick the crops, so my daddy lost his job. And that's when we had to move. I remember us leaving. I was four, I think. So you can tell here, she's a very young girl. Leaving Mississippi and moving to the city of New Orleans. So in 1957, the family moved to New Orleans. Ruby's father became a janitor, and her mother took care of the children during the day. But after they were tucked in bed, Ruby's mother went to work scrubbing floors in a bank. Every Sunday, though, the family went to church. Ruby's mother said, we wanted our children to be near God's spirit. We wanted them to start feeling close to him from the very start. So this is a lovely picture of Ruby's mother giving the, her and her siblings a hug before she went to do her night job. At that time, black children and white children went to separate schools in New, New Orleans. The black children were not able to receive the same education as the white children, and it wasn't fair. And it was also against the law, the nation's law, 
that is. So in 1960, a judge ordered four black girls to go to two white elementary schools. Three of the girls were sent to McDonough 19 and six-year-old Ruby Bridges was sent to the first grade to William Franz Elementary School. Here she is with her mother getting the direction from the Supreme Court Justice, from the judge. Ruby's parents were proud that their daughter had been chosen to take part in an important event in American history. They went to church. We sat there and prayed to God, Ruby's mother said. We sat there and prayed that we would all be strong and that we'd have courage and that we'd get through any trouble. We prayed and prayed that Ruby would be a good girl and that she would hold her head up high and be a credit to her own people as well as a credit to all American people. We prayed long and we prayed hard. Here they are in church praying. On Ruby's first day, a large crowd of angry white people gathered outside the Franz Elementary School. The people carried signs that said that they didn't want black children in the white school. And people called Ruby names, bad names. Some even wanted to hurt her. The city and state police did not help Ruby. It was the President of the United States who ordered federal marshals to walk with Ruby into the school building. And the marshals carried weapons just in case they needed to defend her. So here's a picture of Ruby surrounded by the marshals facing these parents who were not very nice to her. I thought you would be interested in seeing from Ruby's book an actual picture of her walking into the school. So here you can see Ruby, she's the little one in her white dress and her mother is holding her hand and she's surrounded by four U.S. Marshals. And you can tell they are U.S. Marshals because they have a band around their arms. So I'm going to read from her autobiography, her first day, what she recalls. So once we were inside the building, the Marshals walked us up a flight of stairs. The school office was at the top. My mother and I went in and we were told to sit in the principal's office. And the Marshals sat outside. There were windows in the room where we waited, and that meant everybody that was passing by could see us. I remember noticing everyone was white. All day long, white parents rushed into the office. They were very upset, and they were arguing and pointing at me. And when they took their children to school that morning, they really didn't think that uh, their school would be integrated that day. After my mother and I arrived, they ran into classrooms and dragged their children out of the school. And from behind the windows in the office, all I saw was confusion. I told myself that this must be the way it is in a big school. But that whole first day, my mother and I just sat and waited in the principal's office. We didn't talk to anybody. I remember watching a big round clock on the wall. And when it was 3 o'clock and time to go home, I was glad. A tough first day. And Miss Ruby Bridges. Every day, for weeks that turned into months, almost a whole year, Ruby experienced that kind of school day. She walked to the front school surrounded by marshals, wearing a clean dress and a bow in her hair and carrying her lunch pail. I wore my bow today for Ruby Bridges. Ruby walked slowly for the first few blocks and as Ruby approached the school, she would see a crowd of people marching up and down the street. Men and women and children shouted at her. They pushed her 
They tried to push toward her, but the marshals kept them from Ruby and threatened to arrest them. And Ruby would just hurry through the crowd and not say a word. A brave young girl trying to pass all these people just to get into the school. The white people in the neighborhood would not send their children to school. And when Ruby got inside the building, she was all alone except for her teacher, Mrs. Henry. There were no other children to keep Ruby company, to play with, to learn with, or even to eat lunch with. But every day, Ruby went into the classroom with a big smile on her face, ready to get down to the business of learning. Mrs. Henry, her teacher, said she was very polite and she worked well at her desk. She enjoyed her time here. She didn't seem nervous or anxious or irritable or even scared. She seemed as normal and relaxed as any child I have ever taught. So Ruby began learning how to read, how to write in an empty classroom, an empty building. Here she is, the only one in her class. Mrs. Uh, Henry, her teacher, would sometimes look at her and wonder how she did it. How she went by those moms every day and sat here all by herself and yet seemed so relaxed and comfortable. Mrs. Henry would question Ruby in order to find out if she was really nervous or afraid, even though she seemed really calm and very confident. But Ruby kept saying she was doing fine. The teacher decided to wait and see if Ruby would keep on being so relaxed and hopeful or if she'd gradually begin to wear down or even decide that she no longer wanted to go to school. It's Mrs. Henry watching her, being very concerned about her. Then one morning, something happened. Mrs. Henry was standing by her window in her classroom, as she usually did, and she was watching Ruby walk toward the school. And suddenly, Ruby stopped, and right in front of the mob of howling and screaming people, Ruby stood there facing all these men and women, and she seemed to be talking to them. This is Mrs. Henry looking out the window. When Ruby got inside, Mrs. Henry saw Ruby's lips moving and wondered what Ruby could be saying. The crowd seemed ready to hurt her. The marshals were frightened, they were on guard, and they tried to persuade Ruby to just keep moving along. Let's get inside. But they tried to hurry her into the school, but she would not budge. Ruby just stopped talking all of a sudden and then walked into the school. Brave young girl in front of all those people. What do you think she was doing? So when she went into the classroom, Mrs. Henry asked her what had happened. Mrs. Henry told Ruby that she'd been watching and that she was surprised when Ruby stopped and talked with the people in the mall. Ruby became a little irritated. I didn't stop and talk with them, she said. Ruby, I saw you talking, said Mrs. Henry. I saw your lips moving. I wasn't talking, said Ruby. I was praying. I was praying for them. Every morning, Ruby had stopped a few blocks away from the school to say a prayer for the people who hated her. But this morning, she forgot until she was right in the middle of the angry mob. Can you imagine? Beautiful little girl like that, saying a prayer to people she knew did not want her to be there and that did not like her just because she was black. When school was over for the day, Ruby hurried through the mob as usual. And after she walked a few blocks, and the crowd was behind her, Ruby said the prayer she repeated twice a day before and after school. Please God, try to forgive these people because even if they say bad things, 
They don't know what they're doing. So you could forgive them, just like you did those folks a long time ago when they said terrible things about you. And this is her praying. Amazing, amazing young lady, Ruby Riches. Later that year, two white boys joined Ruby at the Franz Elementary School. Their parents were tired of seeing the boys get into mischief around the house when they could have been in school learning. So the mob became very angry when the first white students went back to the school. But those boys were soon joined by other children. So Ruby was no longer alone. And they all did get their education. Ruby and a growing number of boys and girls who went to school with her. And by the time Ruby was in the second grade, the mobs had given up their struggle to scare Ruby and defeat the federal judge's order that New Orleans schools be desegregated so that children of all races might be in the same classroom. Year after year, Ruby went to the front school and she graduated from it. And then she went on to graduate from high school. But the story continues because Ruby Bridges is still alive. Ruby Bridges is married to a building contractor and has four sons. Now a successful businesswoman, she has created the Ruby Bridges Educational Foundation. With its focus on education, community, and the future of our nation's children, the foundation is especially dedicated to revitalizing her elementary school, William Franz School which is located in the heart of Ward 9 in New Orleans, a very depressed area. Ruby is once again stepping to the forefront and embracing it, embracing the opportunity to make history by contributing to the challenge that our nation is facing in the, in the recovery efforts following Hurricane Katrina. And so this book was written around that time, but really we, are, we continue to face these kinds of challenges across the nation, ensuring that public schools are what they need to be in terms of having access to the appropriate materials and that they are providing equal education for all children, black, white, whatever. There is also a special exhibit featuring Ruby's story at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's called the power of children making a difference. And Ruby Bridges, certainly, you know, her story of courage, of faith, and hope is really one to be admired. Again, let me show you a picture of Ruby Bridges. By the end of the year, this is what her classroom looked like. So she had friends. There were boys and girls in her class, and she was really happy. She graduated from high school. You can see that little picture here with her high school, uh, high school head on. And later, a really cool thing happened. She and Mrs. Henry, her teacher that first year, were reunited um, on TV. Uh, with a meeting um, with uh, Oprah and uh, to share their story. So both of them are trailblazers, but Miss Ruby Bridges, a courageous, a faithful, a prayerful young lady who changed the history of uh, school integration in New Orleans. I hope you've enjoyed that story. Thank you for listening and for sharing in this storytelling time with me. And thank you for your support, continued support of Do It Now, as we raise much needed supplies and materials for children, needy children across uh, the United States who need it uh, so that they can be prepared for school. Now remember to wash your hands and spread some love. We really need it these days. Thank you very much for listening and God bless. Take care.